good morning and good afternoon to everyone joining uh, us for the workshop. Uh, we still see some people in the waiting room uh, and a lot of people are still joining the event. So we will give it a couple of moments and uh, we'll start uh, the workshop uh, shortly. Uh, one more time, uh, hello to everyone joining us uh, from all over the world. Uh, my name is Monica and I will present ALJ Group. We are very happy to host and moderate uh, today's workshop. However, uh, the, the content of the workshop and the presentation uh, will be uh, delivered by uh, two experts from RSC Biosolutions. Um, Andy Otto and Dr. Larry Beaver. So today we are joined at the Rubric and Selection of Performance Monitoring Best Practices Workshop. And before I give uh, the floor to our uh, speakers of the day, I would like to briefly introduce uh, the experts you will be hearing from uh, during the, the session. Uh, so we will be joined by uh, Larry Beaver, who is the Vice President of Research and Development at ROC Biosolutions. Uh, Dr. Um, Larry Beaver oversees uh, research and uh, development uh, and regulatory functions uh, for the Envirology and Futera products at the organization. Uh, for over 30 years, uh, Dr. Beaver has been actively involved in the commerce, commercialization of safer consumer and industrial chemical products. Uh, his current research efforts focus on VGP compliant cleaners, gear oils, greases, and hydraulic fluids for land and marine applications. Um, Dr. Beaver is the principal inventor on more than 14 uh, patents. He is an active member of SPLP and NLGI and currently serves on the Industry Advisory Board uh, for the Tribology Minor in the College of Engineering uh, at Auburn University. Uh, so this is a short introduction of our first speaker, uh, Dr. Beaver. You also see some information on your screen. And now um, let's move to a short presentation of, uh, of our second speaker uh, from RST Solutions, uh, Annie Otto. Uh, Annie is the Senior Development Applications Manager at the organization. Uh, she oversees marine technical support, as well as R&D, regulatory functions, and OEM approvals for Envirologic and Futera products. 
Uh, Annie has been working at RFC Bio Solutions for eight years, and she has been actively involved in developing and receiving environmental and equipment approvals for industrial products. Her current efforts are focused on expanding approvals in marine equipment and environmental regulations. Uh, so this uh, would be a few words from my side uh, uh, in terms of introducing today's speakers. And now I would like to invite our speakers uh, to join me on stage. Uh, hello, hello, Larry. Nice to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Larry and Annie. Uh, so, uh, with no further ado, I give you the floor and I will uh, be joining you for the Q&A session after your presentation. Thank you, Monica, for that introduction. I appreciate it. Let's talk a little bit about the key takeaways. What can you expect to draw from this webinar today and some information? Um, not all EALs are the same and the selection of the correct environmentally acceptable lubricant can have a significant impact on your equipment and on your equipment's lifetime. So we'll talk a little bit about what are the differences in biolubricants, give some updates on the different types. Why does it matter which uh, EAL you choose for an application? And how can you maximize your return on investment when you purchase and use an EAL. Our company's been around since 1924. We've been in the lubrication business since 1941. Uh, this is a shot of the, uh, the original facility that no longer exists in Charlotte. It's been replaced. But this is, we've a privately owned, family owned company since the inception of the company. And we have a deep commitment both to sustainability and high performance lubricants. We have a very broad offering and it is evolving quickly as market demand increases in more specialized area. We have a full line of hydraulic fluids. We have a full line of gear oils, specialty fluids for ROV applications, uh, general lubrication, uh, universal tractor fluids, so saw oils, barn chain oil, as well as saw guide oils for sawmill operations and engine oil. Uh, wire rope, uh, application of uh, wire rope lubricant is also uh, in our ballpark. And we have a full uh, line of greases, everything from uh, extremely heavy duty, high weld load grease to tack of tackifying grease to water repellent, extreme pressure greases, and even rail curve applications. We also have a line of cleaners and disinfectants that are uh, VGP compliant. So let's talk a little bit about how things have changed. Uh, the risk is greater now than ever before, given the environmental impact of some of the conventional lubricants, as well as the regulatory environment that they're now being used in. The metrics have changed. No longer is it now a simple matter of judging, well, is it cheaper to use or cheaper to clean up, or how much does it cost if I have a spill? Now publicity, negative publicity, as well as positive public relations play a part in making the decision on whether or not to use an EAL. Then versus now, you know, at one time, if you used an environmentally friendly product, if you touted the product as green, it almost invariably was a poorer performer than the product it replaced. There were usually, with respect to lubricants, problems with uh, resistance to water, as well as oxidation from heat. Generally, the products were fairly limited availability didn't have worldwide distribution. They were usually for very specialized niche applications. Uh, for instance, like the food industry, uh, baking ovens and that lubricating chains going into baking ovens and that kind of thing. Uh, they gave a questionable return on the investment because they were usually more expensive 
didn't last or work any better than the standard lubricant and often performed uh, poorly. And usually major equipment changes were needed. Now that has changed. Uh, modern environmentally acceptable lubricants can offer in many cases increased performance over the mineral oil based product they replace. They are globally available now covering a broad range of applications for both land and marine. They have an improved total cost of ownership in that while they may be more costly than a standard mineral oil product, their ease of use and lifetime under the right circumstances can make the product, um, keep the product at parity with the mineral oil. And they are usually, but not always, compatible with existing systems, depending on what kind of seal technology is used in those systems. So reducing envir environmental risk no longer means compromising. Our company believes that the, the key to success in this industry, as well as any industry seeking sustainability, is to make sustainability, and in this case, biodegradability, minimally toxic characteristics, non-sheening and non-bioaccumulative, absolutely mandatory for the products they produce. But on the other hand, not compromise performance, give, better or equivalent chemical stability, system capability, compatibility, and equipment longevity. So no longer are these a separate goal, no longer are these uh, compromises being made in most applications. Let's talk a little bit about the technology of what makes an EAL. Well, what is an EAL? It's environmentally acceptable lubricant, and it's defined very clearly in the vessel general permit administered by the US EPA. The product, the lubricant has to be readily biodegradable as defined by the EPA, which is greater than 60% biodegradability in 28 days in recognized industry testing, has to be minimally toxic, and there's a whole list of requirements within the VGP itself defining what that term means and it cannot be bioaccumulative. Once again, there are criteria in the VGP to explain that term or to define that term. Uh, we go beyond that to produce products that are non-sheening and we meet the, this requirement for virtually all the lubricants we produce and offer in the marketplace. So let's talk a little bit about what, what's the basis, if you will, of creating an EAL. Well, we all understand that lubricants are a combination of a base oil and an additive package of some kind, which can include EP additives, anti-wear additives, thickeners, viscosity index improvers, pore point depressants, and a whole variety of additives. But the basics of the formula are tied with respect to biodegradability and toxicity are often tied intimately, and stability in particular, are often tied intimately to the base oil chosen. And the ISO standard recognizes four types of base oil for an EAL. The first are the triglycerides, often called vegetable esters, things like canola oil and soybean oil. The next are polyalkylene glycols, sometimes called PAGs. Uh, the third are the synthetic esters, which currently have the lion's share of the market in the marketplace for at least the marine environment. And synthetic esters are typically now saturated to improve their stability, their oxidative stability in particular. And then the last category is HEPR, which are the poly polyalpha olefins and other related hydrocarbons, synthetic hydrocarbons. Uh, we uh, play quite heavily in the area of the HEPR technology. And when I talk about HEPR moving forward, that while that designation is for an, an, an environmentally acceptable hydraulic fluid in the ISO standard, we refer to HEPR base oil technology and use it in gear oils as well as greases in addition to the hydraulic fluids. Each of the hydraulic fluids, greases or gear oils, is characterized primarily by the chemical composition of the base oil. Now, I'm not discounting the massive impact that additives have in the formula, but I think most formulators would agree that most of the stability 
issues associated with um, environmentally acceptable lubricants tie directly back to the base oil selected. Not all EALs are the same. This chart shows the, a comparison of the four types uh, moving down the list from triglyceride to PAG, to synthetic ester to PAO, and then the four major characteristics. There are other characteristics, but these are, these are four primary ones. The first is oxidation resistance, which is the resistance of, of, to degradation by oxygen, and that generally occurs at double bonds. Then we have water resistance, which you may hear referred to as hydrolysis, and then a measure of lubricity and how how broadly is the product uh, compatible with different seal types? In general, PAOs and synthetic hydrocarbons perform better than the synthetic esters, the PAGs, or the triglycerides when everything is considered in balance for all four of these characteristics. And that's one of the reasons why the majority of our products are, are HEPR type uh, base oils. You know, what characterize? Oh, there we go. We've got a, a polling question. Does your company currently utilize EALs? We'll leave this up on the screen for a few moments to allow folks an opportunity to answer. And the second poll, if your company currently utilizes EALs, what type do you use? Triglycerides, synthetic esters, polyalkylene glycols, or polyalpha olefins and other synthetic hydrocarbon products? Thank you for answering those questions. I know we appreciate that feedback. Uh, what characteristics make a good lubricant? Well, we've got you know, three keys to lubricant performance, and uh, some of them are tied to the base oil, some of them are tied to the additive package, and most of them are a combination. Uh, viscosity and lubricity, we of course recognize right away that we need to have a sufficient viscosity to form a film in, under the use conditions and be lubricious enough, slippery enough to offer low enough co coefficient of friction. Anti-wear and extreme pressure characteristics are important when we move from hydrodynamic lubrication towards more boundary lubrication. And then of course stability, which is a key factor because there's no point in having a high performance product if it doesn't last in the piece of equipment. So we'll talk a little bit about viscosity and lubricity. Now viscosity requires stability. Uh, you want the material to be stability to or stable with respect to viscosity. You don't want to shear out of grade as it's as it's called. Uh, this 
viscosity ties to the film thickness and strength of the product in use. As the viscosity drops uh, due to shear, you lose your your protective, you can lose your protective layer. And of course, the, the low coefficient of friction is necessary for energy saving and performance. Anti-wear characteristics. Uh, Anti-wear characteristics are most generally tied to the additive package being put into the product. Having the right blend of EP and anti-wear characteristics maximizes the uh, performance of the product. And they, they have to be selected to be uh, compatible with the base oil technology. Um, additive lifetime as well as base oil lifetime can be impacted by poor choice of additives. And of course, the extreme pressure properties are key when uh, lubricants are under high load. Making the correct choice of additives uh, even, even more important. We've talked about stability. Stability is key. If the product doesn't work for long enough, if it doesn't make it through a five-year dry dock cycle, it's not doing you much good. It's nothing more than a headache at that point. Key characteristics of stability, uh, you want the product to be shear resistant, to stay in grade. Uh, you want compatibility with other lubricants because often lubricants get either intentionally or unintentionally uh, mixed in an application. Product has to be resistant to oxidation. That can be an issue associated with, with, with which base oil is chosen as well as the additives used in the product. The additives can often can often hinder and often help uh, resistance to oxidation if they're correctly chosen. Resistance to hydrolysis. Uh, water contamination is the primary culprit causing decomposition. And the uh, reaction of water with the product causes viscosity loss, decreased lubricity, and often byproducts that can have a chemically negative impact on the performance of the product. So now we'll talk a little bit about what could possibly go wrong. And I'll turn it over to Annie for her to wrap things up. Thank you, Dr. Beaver. So now we're going to start to move more from the chemistry aspect of um, the lubrication to the actual application side of lubrication. So as Larry said, what could go wrong with these giant complex pieces of equipment, whether it be in the in the water, near the water, or able to get water into the system. So water is a problem in obviously the marine environment. You have your vessels sitting out in a big giant ocean, but also can be a problem in other environments. Most hydraulic pump failures happen because of a contamination in the system, whether it be water causing um, cavitation in the pumps or dirt in the system causing unnecessary wear. The salt water can also create chemical reactions that create a corrosive environment, which can negatively affect the seals in the system and the metal surfaces in the system. Water in many systems is pretty impossible to prevent, but it can be monitored and actions can be taken to avoid the negative impacts on the equipment. Some of these negative impacts can be failures, um, unnecessary repairs, downtime, and loss in productivity. There's many signs of failures and indicators of potential failures in a system. And just to name a few, there's fluid cloudiness, oxidation, hydrolysis, higher operating temperatures, um, reduced fluid viscosity, reduced lubricity, uh, surface corrosion, pump cavitation, and fluid foaming. And there's many ways to prevent um, system failures and we're going to focus on two of those today one of them that we'll be discussing first is choosing your lubricant wisely uh, dr beaver went over a shortened version of this chart in the chemistry aspect i'm going to try and summarize it and focus more a little bit on applications as to why you would choose one or another over the other um, in the eal sense um, the last column does show mineral oils but i'm going to focus on the first four so the triglycerides or HETG are the least expensive 
and also have the poorest water resistance, making them not very oxidatively stable. So they wouldn't be the best choice to be used in a marine environment. But they do have other applications for some, industri some industrial applications and mostly land applications where there's short change out intervals and little chance of water getting in the system. Next would be the polyalkylene glycols or the PAGs. Um, these are pretty difficult to work with in most systems because they're incompatible with a lot of other fluids and even common seals. And also if you're using, if there's any unnecessary or any quick change outs that need to happen or top offs, like I said, they're pretty incompatible so, with other products. So if something happens and you need a quick fix, this is not the product you want to work with. Also in the water standpoint, PAGs are miscible with water. So once that water gets in the system, it will not come out very easily, if at all. So this can cause rust and um, other corrosive um, things to happen within the system. Next is the synthetic esters. And like Dr. Beaver said, these are the most prevalent in the marine industry, especially now moving towards more stable saturated esters, but they can still, um, have some oxidative and hydrolytic instability when water is introduced into the system, shortening some dry docking um, periods, which we'll see in some, pre in some of the next slides ahead. And then lastly, HEPRs. Um, these are the most similar to what most users are used to using because they're like similar to, the chemistry is similar to the conventional mineral oils that they're using and they're the most hydrolytically and oxidatively stable and are compatible with many seal types. Sometimes you don't even have to change from the seals you're using to use our product compared to some of the other products out on the marketplace. So another way to prevent system failures is to follow some best practices. Some of these best practices can be set out by the original equipment manufacturer. Um, some by just following regular maintenance and warranty recommendations, checking the fluid levels, making sure you're not running the system dry, which could cause pump issues, establish regular fluid and filter changes. Um, like I was saying before about pump failures, if you're not changing your filters out regularly, the dirt can build up, which can cause unnecessary wear or damage to the pumps in the systems. Don't, don't ignore leaks or other signs of issues. And last, or in, um, in working with all of these, you can also implement an oil analysis program. So today, for, of the best practices, we're going to focus on an oil, how to um, use an oil analysis system and how it can help stretch out um, either the length of the fluid or catch system failures. So oil analysis, or it also can be called condition monitoring, and I'll probably use both terms going forward, is known as the analysis of a lubricant's condition by its key properties, suspended contaminants, and wear debris within the fluid, or a fluid. So what are some benefits of using a condition, an oil conditioning or oil analysis program? Um, condition monitoring provides a snapshot of what the lubricant um, looks like and can signal if adjustments need to be made. It will give a detailed analysis of the performance of a lubricant. So what's the viscosity look like? Some of the details on um, oxidation or breakdown of the fluid, if there's any wear, and many other things. Um, it could provide a cost savings. So instead of maybe changing your fluid out every thousand hours of use, you can look at how the fluids working and maybe extend those intervals and change out your fluid by um, the oil condition and not by time. Uh, monitoring the oil can give you the maximum performance out of the lubricant and the equipment. So like I said before, if you're looking to see how everything's working together, then you'll be able to probably push the fluid a little farther and make sure that nothing is happening to your equipment with the metals in the system. This can also avoid some emergencies. You'll have a more proactive approach to fixing things rather than a reactive. You may be able to see things coming rather than things just breaking and having to fix it as it go. 
So with that approach, then you're having less repairs and less downtime. And lastly, that's called, that's letting you have a better overall value from your investment in the oil. You'd be able to use it longer and have less downtime to fix your equipment. So how does an oil analysis program work? Um, simply, you take a sample from whatever system you want to have analyzed. Usually you have to fill out a form and give as much information as you can about what the product is, where it came from, how long it's been used, and so forth. You send that sample to your program administrator or the lab that runs the sample. The sample is run at the lab for the effects of wear on the machinery, the degradation of the oil, and some other things. The results then interpolated and sent back to the customer. Um, most oil analysis programs, it, once the sample's received, it could, it could take a week, but most usually within a few days of the sample receiving, um, you can get your results. So what are some best practices when using an oil analysis? Uh, first and foremost is to establish a consistent and regular sampling schedule. Um, you can either do this with your the OEM, maybe the OEM provides how much you want it. Um, some marine class societies have recommendations of how often you should do it to keep your class, or you can do it in conjunction with your lubricant provider. Um, if it's a new system and you're not sure how the oil is supposed to work. You may want to do it monthly until you feel comfortable of what everything looks like, and then maybe move to a quarterly um, analysis. I'd say most of our customers are on a quarterly uh, analysis basis, unless it's a new system and a new um, fluid that they're not quite used to using. Um, second, using an independent lab for your oil analysis to make sure that you're getting the most unbiased and correct information. Next, inquire about the costs of your oil analysis program. Um, if you're doing it, it, many different oil analysis places, that costs can vary from place to place, and it could be very costly. Or if you partner with a manufacturer like RSC, we can offer some an oil analysis program at a low or almost no cost um, basis as a value added service if you use our products. Another one is acting on the data. Make sure that when you're getting these reports, you're actually looking at them and fixing anything that you see so that you're getting the best life out of your fluid and your equipment. So polling question, does your company currently utilize an oil conditioning monitoring program? Yes or no? So let's dive a little deeper into some of this oil analysis. Um, on the next few slides, you're going to see different oil analysis charts from different vessels either we've been in, vessels that we've gotten, that we've taken over from that had other fluids use, um, being used. So in your oil analysis, you'll see a couple different things. Um, one would be the viscosity at whether it be 40C or 100C, and that temperature can depend on um, what type of fluid you're using. Uh, total acid number to monitor your um, use the fluid light, the water content, obviously indicating how much water is in your system. There'll be a elemental content, which can tell you one of two things: one um, being wear in the system, and two any additive content. Uh, and lastly, particle count. And of the in the following slides, the only one we won't really be covering is particle count because it's not really easy to trend. 
And once water is in the system above 500 parts per million, the particle count gets a little um, wonky and uh, it can't be read with the infrared because it's picking up too many water particles. Some other things from these oil analysis reports, when you get them, you want to um, make sure you're maybe get a sample report first so you can be familiar with the data that you're looking at. Make sure that they're giving you a comprehensive report that maybe offers a deeper level of analysis in some of these categories. And with that, also that it includes some recommendations to make sure your lubricant and your machine is um, being used to the best of its ability. So as I said, next we're going to go through a few um, applications with, diff with some of our lubricants, some of other lubricants, and a couple of these different factors. So this first slide, we're talking about the 40 degree viscosity in the stern tube application. Um, the top, the green lines are the limits of the ISO 68 viscosity range. Um, as you all know, most fluid dry docks go for five years. And this, with this company that we work with, um, we monitored not obviously just the viscosity, but many other aspects. But for this chart, we're showing that after five years and even longer, almost going into nine years, this product has never gone out of viscosity grade. They were able to um, just take it out, filter it, clean it up a little bit, and put it back in to continue on for um, the remainder of the time. So obviously working with them and using this oil analysis, we're able to extend the life of their fluid and um, their stern tube. So that's one case study here. The next, we're going to go into a little bit more of the stability, where how water and fluid degradation can kind of go hand in hand. So this is another product of ours in a system. On the right, or on the left, I'm sorry, you'll see the water content in the system over a nine-year, I believe it's almost a nine-year period. And you can see most systems, they have an alert of less than a thousand parts per million you want in the system. You can see a couple times in over the fluid life in the system, it's spiked up pretty high to 4%, sometimes less. But as soon as they saw that water spike, they took action and made sure it was taken out properly. But, in, but also with that, having a stable hydraulic fluid, you can see on the left when it comes to the acid increase, there wasn't much of an effect of having the water in, water in the system over the life of the product. Yeah, it varies a little bit because of product life and just variability in the test. But with a stable hydraulic fluid, even with massive, some massive water increases, but being taken care of quickly, there's no real effect on the hydraulic fluid and they were able to use it well past the um, one dry docking cycle. Where in contrast, on the next slide, we have a competitive product that we replaced in a system. And as you can see on the left here, the water um, got into the system, whether it be from something happening to the seal or just water ingress, it got up to about two to 3%. Some of it did come out, they tried to fix the problem. Um, they did end up trying to remove Part of the product and top it off with new to keep going hopefully making it to their five-year dry dock but they are still having some sort of water ingress issue and as you can see because of the product not being quite as stable as our product the acid spiked well above the critical and cautionary limits and this is where they changed it at about two years or two and a half years and then it even with the change out, the acid buildup was so bad in the system that it continued to um, go well above the cautionary and almost into the critical limits, which caused them to have to early, have an early dry dock and replace the fluid in the system. So those two applications shows the how a stable hydraulic fluid with the ingress of water and also um, using um, reacting to your oil analysis can make an effect on the system. So next, uh, we did a look for the elemental analysis. We were looking at it more from an additive standpoint than a wear standpoint. Um, for EALs, most EALs do not contain zinc or calcium. 
if those are in the system, they usually is a sign that's being topped off with a mineral oil. The mixture of these two isn't always going to affect the oil in a bad way while, what, for performance standpoints. But if this product, if it were to leak into the ocean, especially within um, the VGP limits, you wouldn't be able to claim it as an EAL anymore. So the top green shows what you normally see for an EAL, which would be phosphorus. And it stays within the limits of what we'd expect to see within a EAL product. And then as you can see down here with the blue and the yellow lines, the red line is the limit of about 5%, which is more than that, you can't really claim an EAL anymore. You can see that it was topped up with another product for a good year almost too, and then finally was topped off back with an EAL to bring it back down in, to an okay limit. As I said, this won't really affect the performance. It's more of just from an environmental standpoint of if this were to leak, you wouldn't really be able to say that you're using an EAL anymore. So the next slide we're going to talk about, so how does this maximize your return on investment? Um, this could maximize it by using um, less lubricant overall. As you can see from some of those systems, we were able to extend the life almost twice the dry dock um, period of the vessel, which would have some maintenance cost reduction, so you wouldn't have to um, you may need to change the seal, but you won't have to buy new fluid to go on top of it. Increased uptime, so less time in dock um, doing all the work. And then increased brain perception. You're using an EAL, so if it were to leak, you, may, you won't have as much repercussions from that. And then, oh, polling question. Which benefits of EALs motivate or incentivize your company to utilize EALs? Um, advanced technologies, superior performance, risk mitigation, uh, EBGP compliance, sustainability, carbon footprint reduction, and or better return on investment. All right, so on this slide, we're showing you some of our trusted customers and partners that have been using our products for many years and also using our oil analysis program to help extend the life of their equipment in these in the different systems that they use. And to wrap it up, here's some contact information for us, and we'll start to take your questions live if you want to submit them to the Q&A tab. Um, if we don't get to everyone's questions, feel free to reach us here at this email um, or via our website, and a team member will respond and make sure Larry and I get some of that. Also, we don't want you to forget to take download the takeaway from the toolbar on your screen, and within a few days of this event, the session will be posted to RSC Bio's website. And I think also if the, you're interested in the slides, please contact um, the sales at RC Bio and Larry or I will make sure that they are given to you. I think that's all. Did I forget anything else, Larry? No, I think you got covered. Thank you, Annie. Excellent. Uh, Annie and Larry, thank you so much for delivering the presentation. I hope everyone can hear me uh, all right because I saw a few uh, comments uh, from the viewers that my voice was breaking, but uh, I hope we managed to fix this issue. So uh, while you were doing the presentation, you were monitoring the Q&A section and we have quite a few questions. 
I encourage uh, the viewers to add a few more questions if you have any thoughts. And maybe I would like to uh, start the Q&A with uh, some questions from our side. So I would like to address uh, the first question to Larry. Uh, what chemically makes an HEPR more stable than a HEES ester type, EAL? Yeah, well, the, the primary difference between uh, ester technology, whether it's a simple ester like a triglyceride or a complex ester, like a saturated ester, uh, the primary differences between that technology and um, uh, polyalpha-olefin and related is there are, there are fewer double bonds in a PAO type product. Uh, any, there, any that exist are there in very, very low quantities, if you will. And that's a site for oxidation. And even in a saturated ester, the hydrolysis is, an, hydrolysis is an issue because there's an ester functionality that can hydrolyze. Now, there are things that ester manufacturers can do to minimize that risk, but it's never eliminated. So with no ester functionality and few, few to no double bonds, the PAOs are inherently more stable than ester products. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and now the second question to Larry, and then I will move on to Annie. Uh, what is the most chemically resistant steel technology utilized? I, think uh, I don't know if you could I think hear that's me. for you, Annie. Uh, yeah, so that would be um, Viton, which is mostly used in the marine environment or FKM, depending on who's making it. Um, but with our products, we're, um, we're resistant to most any type of seal material. Uh, great. Then uh, moving on uh, with a few questions for Annie. Uh, what happens if water gets into an HES base turn to oil? Um, if the water gets in and isn't treated quickly, like we saw in some of the slides, it can create acid um, in the system and can cause seal fa failures. Um, but if it's treated, quickly, there's still a risk that the hydrolysis that Larry talked about before can happen, but hope maybe not as quickly as we saw in some of those slides. Uh, and one more question for you, Annie. Uh, is this type of oil analysis applicable or uh, relevant to gear oils as well as hydraulic fluids? Uh, yeah, yes it is. Um, we do it on gear, some of our own gear oils. It also can be used in many different types of fluids and applications. It's used in engine oils um, a lot. So it can be used in many different types of fluids and applications. The only one that oil analysis really wouldn't work for would be a grease. Great, uh, thank you so much. And before moving uh, to the Q&A from the viewers, I have uh, the last question from my side uh, uh, for Larry. What are the anticipated advancements in oil monitoring technology? Well, the, the uh, oil monitoring technology right now is, is tied to some, I won't say simple, that's, that's certainly not fair to the technology, but measurement of viscosity, water content, uh, particle count, some of, the, some of the more basic physical characteristics, as well as looking for uh, iron contamination, wear debris, uh, where the limitation of on the, inline, online condition monitoring is right now is the inability to e easily analyze for the elements associated with the additive package. And I see that as a, as a great uh, opportunity for the industry to uh, develop uh, rapid tests for, for those materials, primarily sulfur and phosphorus in EALs. Um, that's a ways out there. Uh, there are systems now under development that will allow more the more basic tests to be done online on board a vessel and then downloaded in real time uh, to the uh, to the cloud that will allow vessel owners to know exactly where they're at with respect to viscosity and moisture contamination and where debris and particle count at any given point in time. 
Uh, great. Thank you so much for taking a few questions uh, from our side. And uh, now, as promised, we are moving uh, to the questions from the viewers. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at the, the Q&A tab. And uh, let's start with, uh, I think it's more of a, a statement than a question, but I will read it out loud and maybe you have you will have some uh, thoughts on, on it. So Clay Boyd is uh, saying, Warnish potential in HEPG samples does not show up in standard oil samples. Uh, this could also be a problem with the other fluid types. Well, uh, varnish is always varnish is always an issue under high heat uh, conditions. Um, in marine applications, for things like stern tube applications, that's not as critical. But deck equipment and high pressure systems, it certainly is. So yeah, uh, varnish formation is something that we always have to keep in mind and check for, particularly during the development of a product. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, next question uh, from Arndt de Groth. Uh, what about listing at Bosch Erect Uh Right now, as far as I know, there's only one EAL on Bosch's approved list. Uh, I think everyone in the industry recognizes that the uh, this new generation of Bosch Rex Roth pumps and the protocol for uh, passing that test is extremely difficult and rigorous, and I only know of one EAL supplier that has passed it. But we're working on it. Yeah, we're we're working on it. Perfect. Uh, happy to hear. Uh, next question comes from uh, Rishi Xavier, and he's asking how much is the maximum allowable water content in the stern tube oil as per RSC oil. Uh, further, what is the maximum viscosity grade for Futera HP series? Um, I can answer that. Um, we usually like to keep the water below a thousand parts per million or 0.1%. Um, our Futera or Envirologic products usually won't even retain that much water. It would be free water at that point. But um, for the other part of that question, the Futera line goes up to an ISO 100 hydraulic fluid as of right now. Um, we've do, been doing a little tinkering to get an ISO 150 as well. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question from Ephiras uh, Suisi. Uh, is it possible to have two same oil grades that has a difference in viscosity and color? Uh, yeah, it's certainly possible. You can you can pull two samples from two different production runs, and uh, could both be graded. For instance, as an ISO 100, one may come in at 95, and may one may come in at 105 uh, centistokes viscosity. Both of those would qualify for a rating as an ISO 100. And color can vary. Uh, it's often tied to the base oil type that's used or the age of the base oil, you see more color variation in things like triglyceride based formulas than you do in a PAO formula because color change is usually an oxidation phenomena. And also some products are dyed uh, and, and given a color intentionally. So sometimes there's variation in that regard too. Uh, thank you. Next question uh, crum comes from Oliver Ferguson. Any thoughts on the use and benefits of using estolite based oils? Well, we've been we've been investigating the estolides, and they, I do believe that they have promise in the industry. Uh, we're working on some formulas right now using estolide based oil technology. Uh, they may be uh, very useful in replacing formulas that currently contain uh, the standard triglycerides. And they may also eventually uh, displace some of the higher performing fluids. And they certainly are a very sustainable option. Great, thank you. Uh, and Jeev George is wondering what is your thought, opinion on a PQ index. Um, I can do that. Uh, oh. We use PQ index in our oil analysis. Um, 
it's good to detect larger particles of but mostly iron metallic um, iron in the system but we i haven't worked with it enough to get a good handle on if it's causing any more damage in the system than having a lot of smaller particles built up Okay, thank you. Um, Arvind Kondagari has a question. Does using biolubricant uh, can affect the stored lubricant uh, contamination? Well, I got to admit, I'm not sure I understand that question, but I'm, I'm thinking maybe he's asking, does, by using a bio-based lubricant, does it, does it degrade or offer contamination issues in storage on the, on the vessel or in the piece of equipment? And the answer to that question is no. A correctly formulated EAL is every bit as stable, if not more stable, than the equivalent grade of mineral oil. The only time that a VGP compliant EAL degrades is when it's released into the environment and under those specific conditions of environmental exposure, it will begin to degrade. But in use and in storage, is, they do not degrade. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Sandy Mitchell uh, is interested uh, to know what water removal techniques you advocate or do you recommend total replacement? This is a good one for you, Annie. Uh, yeah, so at least with our products, we water can be removed fairly easily um, since our products separate from water pretty readily. Um, the free water can be just drained off from the bottom and then if there's any entrained water we are we have been tested with numerous different systems from um, cc jensen and hydac so any of their um, dewatering systems can work with our product fine um, at least for our products we've never because of water ingress had to have a total replacement um, from degradation but that may happen the only type of fluid that water that I have not seen water removed from would be a pack based system. I don't know that it chemically can be removed once it's entrained. Thank you. Uh, Oliver Ferguson uh, is asking, uh, is saying that it was mentioned that RSC bio products are non sheening. What are the benefits of this feature and is this accomplished uh, using dispersant? Well, I'll answer part of the question and Annie can answer the other part of the question. Um, we have, we are specifically non um for both regulatory reasons and uh, for public relations reasons. Um, it's been, I think a couple of years ago, some uh, passengers were getting off a, a major, a ship, run by a major cruise line and there was a very large oil sheen on the water uh, at the uh, stern of the ship and they snapped photographs and started sending them around and it made it on the news and the PR damage to that company was massive based on that uh, large oil slick behind the, uh, behind the ship. So there's more than one reason for uh, limiting sheen. Uh, we do not use dispersants limit sheen. Our technology for sheen limiting is proprietary. I'll let Annie talk a, bit, a little bit about the regulatory aspect of uh, sheening. Yeah, so I think at least in the U.S. it's the Clean Water Act that requires a product to be non-sheening. Um, it's not directly written in the VGP, but um, we've just taken the stance of make creating non sheeting products. Yeah, I, I wouldn't argue the point that having a product that sheens is easier to easier to detect. But I think the public relations risk associated with that easy detection uh, is far outweighed by the or far outweighs the uh, the benefits of early warning. And I think also just because a product is said to be non sheening doesn't mean that you can't see it. Our product's not sheen sheening, but if it spills, you can't see it. It just doesn't have a, the rainbow effect or the iridescence that is considered sheening by the um, test method that is used to define a non-sheening product. 
Uh, excellent, thank you. Next question comes from Anjeev George. Uh, he's asking, uh, what is your recommendation on water content limit? So there's, I guess, I'll answer that in two ways. Um, in application and in use, we say less than a thousand parts per million, but in when we manufacture our products, um, we've used, we don't let anything out with unless it's less than, I believe it's 300 parts per million. So you wouldn't be getting, and it's never that high. Um, at least in the eight years I've worked here. So um, you won't be getting a product that has a lot of water in it, but in use it's higher because some of it is, as we said, unavoidable to get water in the system. Thank you. Uh, next question from Sandy Mitchell. Uh, do you recommend that, that mineral oil can be used or do you advise against it? Well, that one's easy. If you want an if if you want an EAL to comply with the vessel general permit or minimize your risk uh, from a public relations standpoint, you can't use a product with a standard mineral oil in it. You have to use a product formulated with one of the four base oil types that I showed in the earlier slide. Of the four, the HEPR comes closest to behaving like a conventional conventional mineral oil. So we would obviously like you to buy HEPR technology from us because it gives product as good or, or gives uh, performance uh, as good or better than the mineral oils it replaces. Uh, thank you. The next question comes from Nadine Halverson. Uh, how sensitive is deterioration of EAL in C with respect to cold temperatures? How much time is expected for deterioration in case leakage or in Arctic waters? Uh, the only way I can answer that question is to, is to tell you based on its, based on its degradability uh, in a standardized test, we know it would degrade more quickly than the conventional mineral oil if it was spilled in cold water. But we can't, there's no way to put an exact time that it would take to degrade because it would be, um, it's dependent upon the temperature, the aeration of the water, and actually the microclimate in that area uh, with regard to the type of organisms that are available. So the only thing I can say for a certainty is that even in cold water, an EA, EAL will degrade more rapidly than a mineral oil, but the conditions uh, under which the degradation occurs would determine how long it takes. So there's no way to predict it with certainty. Thank you for taking this question. We have, still have a few more. Uh, next question comes from Plutarchos. Is it better to use mineral or synthetic oil for air compressors, a piston and screw type? Well, typically synthetic oils are going to be more resistant to oxidation than mineral oils. Um, the process by which a synthetic oil is made, whether it's a um, hydro-treated hydro product or whether it's fully synthesized from what's known as a GTL or gas to liquid technology, is that the, the, the molecules, if you will, in a synthetic system are, they're, they're very much designer molecules. They've been built from the ground up for stability. So their, their branching is extremely controlled um, and they're cross-linking and everything that goes on in the reaction. Uh, standard mineral oil, I think, generally speaking, is always gonna be less stable than a high quality synthetic in this kind of application. Great, thank you. Uh, Simona Greco is greeting you from Norway and is asking, uh, is quality monitoring more important by use of fully synthetic ester-based hydraulic oil compared to the traditional use of mineral oil? I would say that quality monitoring, but either by oil analysis or an inline technique installed on, the, on a vessel is far more important with a fully synthetic ester technology because as a fully synthetic ester as good as it is still has uh, an achilles heel a weak link at the ester linkage so very very consistent monitoring for water 
is necessary to make sure that hydrolysis doesn't begin. Thank you. Uh, Angus MacDonald is asking, in your experience, what is the most recognized or valued independent VGP compliance certificate, such as Echo Label, Blue Angel, etc.? I think well, I'd say Echo Label is probably the top of that list. Yeah, I, I would agree. It certainly, um, it certainly got the. Uh, the broadest recognition. Uh, the VGP does recognize uh, that compliance with the other uh, uh, certifying bodies uh, qualifies the product as VGP compliant. Um, and I can speak from our experience that the eco label, uh, the eco label system and environment is the easiest to work within and certainly very well recognized in the industry. Uh Thank you uh, for, for taking this one. A question from Jason Gasparic. If you have an oil spill and are using EEL, is it true that USCG would not issue a fine because it is not considered as a regular oil split, uh, spill? Sorry. I wouldn't go so far as to say that they wouldn't issue a fine. I do believe that the type of lubricant helps mitigate the extent of the fine and the final cost. And I think it can vary by um, Coast Guard post in which in which state it's in. It's kind of, it's not all, unfortunately, one unified system that I know of. Uh, great. Uh, thank you for uh, taking uh, this one. Mm, a question from Satya Kamraut. Why are there that why there are there so many stern tube bearing failures, especially for systems using EALs? Well, I'll jump in. This is a bit of a this is a bit of a hot potato. Uh, there's no there's no there's no single answer. Uh, there are a variety of factors involved. Uh, DNVGL did a study a couple years ago on stern tube failures and issued recommendations based on that. But there does appear to be, uh, certainly in our experience, there's, there's appears to be a correlation between the base oil type and the failures. Uh, I can say that we've never had a failure in our HEPR product lines in a stern tube application or a thruster application. Um, the, there is more to a stern tube failure than simply the fluid in it. Alignment plays a key role. So there is no simplistic answer to why these failures were occurring. Uh, it's a combination of factors, base oil technology, misalignment, and in some cases, because they were in the ship during uh, sea trials, there were incredibly heavy loads put on the system. Uh, thank you. Another question from Jason Gasparic. Uh, what kind of testing is or has been done with EELs in machines that have a shared brake and hydraulic oil system? For example, a forklift that has hydraulic wet disc brakes and typically needs a friction modifier to reduce brake noise, but that modifier causes the EEL to no longer meet EEL requirements. Yes, this is, this is an incredibly difficult uh, formulation problem. And frankly, it's a formulation problem that many of us are still working on. This highlights the point that there are additive suppliers in the marketplace that are constantly working on environmentally safe additive packages, what would be considered non-metal containing ashless uh, additives. Uh, there are not a lot of options for shared systems right now because uh, as Jason points out, uh, there are compromises that almost always have to be made with respect to the additive packages. So um, it, it is a difficult, uh, a difficult uh, process. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tom Gorison wants to know which precautions should you take when switching from 
mineral oil or esters to HEPR? Um, for the most part, if you're switching to our product, uh, we recommend that you drain the system as well as you can and maybe do a flush with the product that you're going to put in it and then again empty it and top it off with our product but again with our product being compatible if that's not the case um you can just empty it as best as you can and then fill it that's not with mineral oils like we were talking about in some of the slides if they contain zinc and calcium that could cause a problem if you don't get all of it out and you're above that five percent limit of um additive metals in the system but um we uh, pride ourselves on trying to make sure we can be just top or put in any system without any uh, issues of uh, uh, incompatibility. Uh, thank you, Annie. Uh, next question comes from Plutarchos. Uh, from where should we take oil samples from a hydraulic system? For example, a reservoir directly from the pump. It depends on the system. Um, for a, like a stern tube, taking it from the, the storage tank isn't the best because of how the system is circulated. Um, you wanna take it from the lowest point or preferably closest to the aft seal or aft bearing. Um, but other systems where the fluid is circulated pretty well, um, taking it from the storage tank is usually an okay place, but it usually just depends upon the system and how well the circulation is um, within that system. Thank you. Uh, Mats Backlund is asking how much better would it be for the EEL oil if you can assure that the water content is continuously below 150 to 200 ppm compared to above 5 to 600 ppm uh, lifetime and functionality? Well, that's a that's a interesting question. The I think regardless of any technology uh, chosen, whether it be a synthetic ester or an HEPR or a, or a triglyceride or, or a PAG, the lower the water content, the better. So that, that caveat is true regardless of the technology you're using. Once you, the next question is, uh, which would be the most forgiving to water contamination? And that would be the HEPR category. Um, practically speaking, our products don't see a difference in you during use uh, between 200 parts per million water and 500 parts per million water, even up to 1,000 parts per million water. They're insensitive, if you will, uh, practically speaking, to the presence of the water. Uh, An ester, a synthetic ester technology, would be more sensitive to the higher levels of water. Uh, but it depends on what particular synthetic ester is being used as the base oil in that hydraulic fluid. Some are more resistant than others to hydrolysis. So there's no cut and dried answer to that, other than to say, in general, good hygiene and keeping the water level as low as possible is what we would recommend, regardless of the EAL selected for the application. Uh, thank you. Uh, Prabhasis Singh would like to know what presence of water result in increase uh, in viscosity, presence of water result in increase in viscosity due to formation of sludge during the oxidation or would the viscosity drop in case of normal synthetic oil? That's very much dependent upon the base oil technology being used. Uh, there are a variety of reactions that occur in a synthetic ester past the hydrolysis past the hydrolysis point there are free radicals formed in the reaction that allows them to recombine and form sludge in general what will be seen when sludge forms is a decrease in viscosity uh, because you're removing you're removing precipitating out 
if you will, ester from the system as part of that sludge formation. So if you draw the liquid up uh, absent of the sludge, you would see a drop in viscosity. Um, it, it's very difficult to make a generalized statement about the HEPR category because we don't see any decrease in viscosity with our product over time. So there's no, there's no way, you know, that you can't say sludge formation because our product doesn't sludge. So in general, high performance HEPR products neither sludge nor do they drop in viscosity over time. I think it also could depend on application. Um, if it's a hotter application, you'd probably see more of that sludge and viscosity change, whereas a lot of the EALs are used in stern tubes and it doesn't really get that hot to be able to form that oxidation sludge reaction. Right. Uh, thank I you. I think you need, a, you need a lot of water in a stern tube to thin out the fluid. And by that, I think you'd know you'd have a real problem. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question comes from Scott Saucier. Is RSC providing their products to other oil manufacturers who are renaming them under their own product portfolio? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, so that's what that one was short and sweet. We can move on to that. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, next question is a bit uh, lengthy, so I will uh, read it uh, in two parts. So uh, let me just read it. Uh, it comes from Ati Gadiri. I think the clean water ad does not require products to be non-sheening. It just uses sheen as one of, of the ways in which they define harmful limits when spills happen and require action. Reference to uh, this included in VGP. Is that not correct? Preventing sheening by additives or use of sinking PAGs with densities greater than water is prohibited. And now the second part of the question. So it is preferred actually to leave sheen for the identification in case of significant spills. Many EALs leave a sheen as well. What would be a difference with sheen or color change in case of your product? Either way, uh, both will show the spill. Okay, I'll, we'll go backwards in this. Yes, both would show a spill, one to a greater extent than the other. And I'd have to go back and look at the VGP and refresh my memory on the statements. But our, our lack of sheen is not, a, is not an intentional move to try to... Uh, avoid responsibility for a spill, not by a long shot. Our, we we are, uh, we want to comply in every way, shape and form with the requirements of VGP and Clean Water Act. Uh, great, thank you. And I think uh, we will uh, close the Q&A sec uh, session with the last uh, question from Satya Kamraut, uh, what sort of lubrication would be required for biofuels? Okay, that's that's a that's not a that's not a simple answer, and that's a, that's another seminar entirely, because it depends on whether or not you're talking about a system oil in a four-stroke engine, a system oil in a two-stroke engine, or a cylinder oil. And right now, to the best of my knowledge, no one is offering EALs for. Uh, those large engine applications because it is uh, to a great extent uh, dependent the additive packages used in those oils is dependent upon the uh, the the base number of the and the sulfur content of the uh, of the fuel being used uh, we have a program in place right now to develop these oils uh, in conjunction with major oems and uh, large shipping company uh, but as far as I know, uh, there is no sustainable option for use in engines yet. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, while you were taking the question, we received the very last one. So I promise uh, the one from Simone Greco will be the very last one and we will close the Q&A session for real this time. Uh, so let me read uh, the question uh, for you. 
do I receive biosolutions offer EEL hydraulic ester base oil for us to still keep the warranty terms from component suppliers like Parker, Hydac, and Bosch Rexroth? Uh, no, we do not offer an ester based EAL specifically for those applications. Uh, our, our policy to maximize the performance of our EALs in high uh, stress conditions. Uh, such as those particular hydraulic system pumps, is to use a HEPR or a PAO and related base oil, not an ester. So we typically do not offer an ester-based solution for hydraulic systems using those pumps. Uh, that being said, uh, we have a, a long list of approvals for all our technologies, and you can contact sales at rscbio.com to discuss specifically your application and pump type, and then we can make a very specific recommendation as to which uh, of our hydraulic fluids, gear oils, or greases would be most applicable to your application. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for delivering the presentation. I also want to really thank the viewers for being so active and asking so many questions. As Larry just mentioned, uh, for all further information, if you need any clarifications, uh, please uh, contact RSC Biosolutions directly. And uh, from ALJ Group side, we are really grateful uh, to Annie and Larry uh, for taking their time today and delivering this very informative and, uh, 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 and, and useful workshop. I believe all of the viewers were really interested and we see that so many of you have stayed until the very end. So uh, I believe uh, we are really taking a lot of useful takeaways uh, from, from this uh, So uh, I don't know, maybe Larry or Annie would like to also uh, uh, say say the, a few last words before we, we close the, the webinar. I'll jump in. I, want, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, for their patience today and for their participation. Uh, I was quite pleased to see the, uh, the large amount of questions that were asked, and I, I very much appreciate being put on the spot a little bit. Every once in a while, it keeps me on my toes. And if you have any questions at all, please reach out to the sales at rscbio.com email address, and they will get that question to me, and I can tailor a more personal answer to your particular application. Uh, great. Uh, so once again, thank you so much uh, to Larry and Annie. We hope to see you in our future events. We even more uh, hope uh, that uh, we will be able to see you in person uh, someday soon. Um, uh, and now from our side, uh, from ALJ Group side, we would like to invite you to check our LinkedIn pages, our, our websites, um, for other upcoming online seminars, we'll have a, a U.S. Green Tech Virtual Forum uh, next week, where you will see uh, a great variety of presenters, and I'm sure we will have many interesting presentations that just the one, like the one we just had uh, today. Uh, so I invite everyone uh, to to check more on our events and activities and. Uh, Today, uh, I think let's call it a day. And uh, once again, a big thank you to the speakers and the viewers. Um, and I wish from ALG Group side everyone a beautiful day. Goodbye.